Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison, and I want to welcome you to day 192 of Humanity Rising. Over the past several days, we've been concentrating on the issue of health as a result of the pandemic. All of us worldwide, as we've experienced our lockdowns and engaged in physical distancing and worn our masks, have been acutely conscious of staying healthy and seeking to navigate as individuals, as families, as communities, as companies, as countries, uh, to navigate through an unprecedented global situation where for the first time in human history, virtually everyone everywhere has been challenged by the same disease. It's been a little virus that has proven itself to be remarkably intelligent and resilient and adaptive. And a year on, bearing in mind that it was last uh, uh, February where the first uh, cases began to appear uh, outside of uh, uh, China, uh, we are still uh, grappling uh, with the pandemic uh, with new variants popping up in different parts of the world, uh, different countries uh, exercising different strategies, uh, and uh, still uh, the pandemic uh, persists. Uh, countries worldwide are now deploying uh, vaccinations of different kinds. Uh, the data is still early, uh, but it appears that the vaccinations are having an effect and that the COVID rates are uh, beginning to go down, uh, but public health officials are uh, uh, indicating uh, that it's a very early stages and we still need uh, to be vigilant as we comport our, our daily affairs uh, with regard uh, to the pandemic. Uh, so uh, we heard from Dr. Chris uh, Byrer from Johns Hopkins University Medical School uh, who was uh, also very deeply uh, involved in the AIDS pandemic. You'll remember that in the 1980s and 1990s, a scourge that went worldwide. Uh, but unlike uh, the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, there was no vaccination. Uh, the AIDS uh, uh, complexio of, uh, of uh, disease factors uh, proved itself to be um, sturdy and remarkably resistant uh, to the kind of cure uh, that has uh, been able to be focalized around vaccinations uh, uh, with COVID. Uh, and then yesterday uh, we had a, again, a remarkable session on how to build up your immune system uh, naturally, uh, not using uh, vaccinations. Uh, as you all know, there's a lot of controversy around the vaccinations, both in terms of the speed um, and the delivery. Uh, we'll be having a session uh, on humanity rising uh, in a few weeks time, looking at some of the other related issues around the, the vaccinations and public health. Uh, but the whole a challenge of how do we, at a time of lockdown, at a time of social isolation, uh, social distancing, uh, how do we uh, bolster our immune systems, um, knowing that community and the way we socialize and our sense of friendship has a lot to do with uh, the strength of our immune system. Uh, so it was a very interesting uh, subject uh, that we uh, dealt with and that we'll return to over the next weeks and months as the pandemic persists. And now today we want to turn to an equally important issue and that is the issue of the development of public health um, within the larger ecosystem uh, of uh, community governments, uh, the environment. Uh, so we're very pleased uh, to have our uh, next session uh, that is being convened by the Nordic uh, Health Alliance and the Europe Health Futures Institution. Uh, so I'd like to now uh, welcome everybody. Thank you all for joining us today and turn the program over to my good friend and, and colleague, uh, Sabina Van Gafka.
Sabinia. Thank you so much, Jim. And I also want to say a warm welcome to all of our viewers from across the world, um, wherever you are out there joining us and all our partner streaming um, partners who are helping us really grow humanity rising and to be a continuation of being a catalyst for change and also incentivizing actions for good. And like Jim said, Today is about health. This is part of a webinar series of five to start with, looking at you know health from all perspectives, a holistic approach to health, and really looking at a European perspective on the health ecosystem in this time of crisis. And it surely is you know such relevance to all of us because without our health, we are nothing. So our health is our most valuable possession in so many ways. And today, as Jim said, is the third um, webinar in this series. And we started by looking at health and humanity in the first series, which really was looking um, in the context of society and communities working together with focus on a community aspect and basis for health and also sharing collective and individual um, responsibility. And then last week, we focused on health by design, um, taking a view on health, both on the consequences of good or um, bad design. And today, also, as Jim mentioned, is about health and the wider ecosystem and really looking from the individual to a societal and then global level at healthcare, or maybe, you know, today we can call it sick care in a sense, and look how we can navigate towards a new paradigm of truly healthcare. Because also like the father, or they say, um, considered the father of Western medicine, I'm sure many of you know Hippocrates said, you know, let food be thy medicine and let medicine be thy food. And when you ponder on that for a second, there is so much encapsulated in just that one sentence, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. But somehow society and, and the pharma industry haven't really given us that narrative to digest, to understand what that actually means, the capacity of our human body, our innate capacity to really um, improve our immune system on a natural basis, which was talked about yesterday and uh, might also be tapping in today. And these webinars are um, initiated, those of you who have seen them before, but for those new viewers who are joining us, um, by two different um, NGOs, European health NGOs, it's Nordic Health 2030 Movement and European Health Futures Forum. And both of these NGOs are really committed to supporting social change and also educating and empowering um, individuals and societies around health with this holistic approach. And just briefly, Nordic Health 2030 is a network of 30 or more Nordic organizations supporting better health through an equal balance of care and prevention. And they're also value driven and committed to trust, openness, creativity, innovation, and of course, also this creative communal aspect. And uh, Nordic uh, Health 2030 is here represented by co-convener Lars Munter, who is convener for all of these um, five sessions. But in addition to that, he's also project leader of um, for communications for Nordic Health 2030 and also head of international projects unit at the Danish Committee for Health Education. And the other NGO, as I mentioned, the European Health Forum is an international network organization that seeks to transform healthcare and improve the well being of European citizens by highlighting and addressing, like we're doing in these sessions, prominent factors that can really impact um, health and wellness. And this company is also value driven and really seeks to address that lens of health and well being. And the European Health Future Forum is here represented by our other co-convener, David Somek, who is network director and convening this together with Lars. And like we do every time on Humanity Rising, we always start these sessions with a one minute heart coherent meditation, really to allow us just to center ourselves, open our mind, open our heart to digest and receive different aspects and to maybe also look at our own aspects and, uh, and above all, I think in this meditation, be appreciative for our own health and send out health to our planet and to our species and humans. So with that, please join me in a one minute heart coherent meditation. It inhales and exhales. <laughs> Nash Bo 
Thank you for joining in that heart meditation. That is also a reminder of something that is vital, life vital to also all of us and also is free, and that is our breath. And it is absolutely a container and a vehicle for health and also boosting our immune system. So just a gentle reminder that to appreciate and sometimes also give ourselves nanoseconds of connecting with our health and in turn connecting with our so-called second brain, which is our gut which is central to our immune system. And with that, I'd like to hand over to today's co-conveners, Lars Munter and David Somek, and their eminent and knowledgeable panelists. Thank you very much, Sabinian. Um, I'm all for uh, a minute of self-care, certainly, um, and a great way to kick off our seminar today, or session today. I'm Lars Munter of the Nordic Health 2030, as Sabinia said. And my co-host, David. Yeah, I'm David Somick of the Health, uh, European Health Futures Forum. So, uh, Lars. David, Mike is working too. That's a good, good way to start, David, right? Well, <laughs> two weeks ago, we started our series of five webinars on European health and future of health with a session on health and humanity, stressing the importance of people, communities as a driver for change. Major change has to be driven by a combination of top-down and bottom-up actions. But for us, especially, well, uh, for the Nordics, for Europeans, social cohesion is crucial to the latter. Social connections mirror all of the other connectivity in the system between the health of humans and the health of the planet, between social equity and better health, between education, especially that which we call health literacy and health and so forth. Indeed. And last week after that, we turn to design as a theme, as Sabine has already highlighted, uh, recognizing that healthcare and health are extremely complex uh, systems. And indeed, they're very people intensive too, which makes them uh, quite difficult to manage. But we didn't go into the detail of that complexity, although we may touch on it today, um, but concentrated on what factors can improve such systems and stimulate innovation particularly. As a parallel consideration though, we looked at how design of cities and how thoughtful investment can also have a significant impact on improving health. Um, Lars, would you, can you show that slide? Or, uh, have you sure, got it ready? Or? I will. Um, this is not the right slide, of course, obviously. Oh, hold on. Uh, let me, <laughs> there we go. Thank you. That's the one. Yeah. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll share it here if I can get the slide share to work because I'm not very good at these kinds of things. Here we go. Apologies for that. And again, the wrong slide. Uh, Sorry, I really am useless. Here we go. Can you see that? We can. Thank you. So, uh, <coughs> apologies for the technical glitches. Um, so, the takeaways from last week, basically, as we saw them, they're rather wordy, but we think they're important. So uh, we learned from our designer friends that designer is a superpower, but it needs critical mass for bottom-up change. And that involves co-production as being essential in changing the design of health delivery systems. We know, for example, it's a kind of joke in the improvement world in health that every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets, which means you get unintended consequences as well as the consequences you want because of your design. For inclusive and people-centered cities, measure what matters, we were told. Uh, for example, obviously the impact of these design on quality of life. Uh, and most of that data exists, but the important thing is, we were told what gets measured gets done. And then finally, in relation, we had two very good uh, speakers about investment. Uh, ESG investment which is uh, the idea of sustainable companies and sustainable investment. Um, the point was made was, um, it's the social dimension that really should matter most in some 
respects, particularly when we're thinking about health, uh, changing the shape of cities by, uh, with looking at access to education, affordable housing, these are all things that influence overall health. And uh, we can, a corollary to that is too much of current investment perpetuates problems rather than helps with them. So sure. Lars. Well, today we look at ecosystems and often we think of these as something purely organic, part of nature, and of course they are, but we can also think of them in terms of our economic system, the flow of money, incentives, reporting, and more that ensures that our society gets oxygen for action, ideally anyway. But this also implies that the ecosystem has intricate balances that can be transformed, adapted, molded, as indeed we often do via financial policies or taxation, for instance. These choices and actions in turn have outcomes that affect our ecology, sometimes with detrimental effects, producing climate change, loss of biodiversity or mutations in viruses. And again, this impacts our health. And next week, we'll talk even more about another ecosystem of, of health, the digital health. Um, our journey today, though, will take us through Nordic transformation, financial transformation and even temporal transformation of different kinds of ecosystems. But let's get going now with Bogi Eliasson of the uh, Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies. And I'll share your slides uh, in a thank second. Thank you. Bogi? Yes, thank you. And thank you very much for uh, setting this up. Uh, um, so very good scene and, and very broad and holistic as needed. Uh, maybe if you put it on, yes. So as, as said in the beginning, we have worked quite hard in the Nordics across the Nordic countries in order to uh, to bridge. Uh, so just if you go to the first one, Lars. Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you. To to bridge between the countries on 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 health and work together, and this is based on a prime minister decision, also on a prime minister decisions of of the countries on being the most integrated region in in the world. So the Nordics by 2030, and we have then taken this this task on saying, how do we do that in health? And we did this process uh, that led to Nord the Nordic Health 2030 movement, which was a scenario process uh, in uh, 2019 with uh, some 30 uh, organizations, public and private, um, reaching a common direction on it. And one of the, one of the conclusions was this, uh, what we call in the Nordics 5-5 aspiration or 50-50 aspiration, going towards having a half of the health budget uh, towards prevention, but also being uh, both primary and secondary and tertiary prevention. So we can begin to work with a long-term health system and not as a sick system, as it was said. So if you um, can go to the next slide, please. Um, and to do that, it's, there is a lot of things and we don't have a lack of, uh, of technology. There is technology to do much more than what we do today. But there is also a, a very system approach everywhere. And how do you get the person in it, which, which also was mentioned. So here we, we, we fleshed out what we end up calling the humano. So with the person in the center, what would we need to look at with things that we have today? So in, in principle, we can say that we, we would need to think both public and personalized health at the same time. We appreciate very much what we have gotten for the humanity with one size fits all health, but we need more. We have technology for more and, and we have different needs, especially with the NCDs uh, today. And, and data is of course a part which is in health, uh, embedded into health and where we have a lot of different challenges with it. So in the end, what we need to look at is what we can call the exposome. So everything that affects you and it's your biological omics. So genomics, proteomics and whatever is of biological functions in you. And then there is the microbiome what lives in and, and, and on you. So that's, that's one side of it. And we have just tried to capture a little bit of that with having environmental factors, biology, social factors, and personal behavior. But there, of course, are other things. But if you, then we have the data controls and the data contracts in it, because one of the push forward was also to acknowledge that we have a social contract, yes, but there was an analog geographical social contract. We have not adapted that to a partly non-geographical digital world. And how, how can you behave and secure a person in that? 
So here we have, if we start in the top left corner, we have four trinities on it. So transparency, traceability, and accountability. So instead of discussing data ownership, then talking about functions of data and securing that with trace of, uh, tra transparency, traceability, and accountability. So whatever linkage data there is, what can link back to you, you will be able to see what it can be used for. And if you go in, into the right corner, uh, bottom corner, where it says consent, don donation, and sharing, we need to figure out how we do a dynamic consent model. So you, you have to share some things. Um, for instance, you can't opt out of your tax record system. Uh, but but you should be able to choose a lot of things. Um, but if we go to the to the top uh, right, interoperability and security and safety of data are very important. Security is often the the cybersecurity. But what we need in a health context is actually safety for for use of the data on the person, and that's more important than the data security. So we also have to think where do we start this uh, this discussions. And then we also have the secondary use uh, and which, which also comes into how do we then lock the data and, and also having an anti-lock-in device, meaning that today a lot of data features have some lock-in so you are bound into some business contract or you can't move it freely or you can't have your data for second opinion. So how can you make these kinds of system and Estonia is an example with, with their invention of X-Road, which Finland also is using in my native Faroe Islands now. So you, you, you require interoperability when you put new things uh, into a system. So this is just saying quite shortly that if we want to work with data in health, there are a lot of things that we need to get in place. And this is not about technology. This is about philosophy of what we want to work out of the technology in, in that part. So if you take the next slide, please. But in the end, if we, if we want to work uh, in a system, we need to, to make this work both for the individual and for the system. So it's both the individual data and it's the aggregated data. The individual data doesn't hold any value if you can't compare it or work with it uh, together with, with other learning. So, so the learning health system actually needs that we have a lot of aggregated data, which we then can make sense of and give back to the individual. Today, the data stream only goes from left to right the system asks for data from the individual. It doesn't give anything back. It might make it usable uh, in a treatment situation, but you don't really give it back. If we want a preventive system, we would need to real time give data back to the individual so you can begin to use this knowledge for your behavior and for your well-being. And then, of course, feed back into the system that also can help in, in, a, in a learning health system. So. So instead of discussing is it the individual or the system that owns the data, we need to transcend and go beyond and say it's the, it's the function of the data that we need. It's not the ownership discussion. And the, and, and the new business model thus needs to be on the, on the function, not on the data that needs to uh, float, float free. And the big dilemma we have here is that we, we are made to think in, uh, think in reductionistic and hyper-specialization. And this we need to bridge with more um, system thinking and, and holistic approach, which is challenging us very much today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bogie. And now for some practical cases on how to actually make some of that happen. Um, we have uh, Nina Ogo of the Nordic Innovation Organization uh, aptly named uh, as a Nordic organization. Um, Nina, uh, your camera still working and your mic? Yes, should be. Yes, I can uh, actually click okay. here. I know that you have a slide and I will start it now. I just have one slide, yes. Yes. Okay. Nina. You can, you can hear and see me now. Yes, thank you. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, thank you. It's nice to be here today. And uh, yeah, we are an um, intergovernmental organization uh, founded by Nordic uh, Council of Ministers and uh, a collaboration partner for Nordic Health uh, 2030. Nordic Innovation is an intermediator organization. Our task is to support ecosystems and enable cross-border collaboration around innovation and entrepreneurship. 
and we work for the Nordic Vision 2030 uh, from the five Nordic prime ministers. The Nordic region to become the most sustainable and integrated region in the world, green, competitive and socially sound. And this means that we also strive for uh, the Nordic region to become the most integrated health region in the world, providing the best possi possible personalized healthcare to all citizens, both in remote locations and in our cities. And uh, this is not something then that we can do alone. We need the international dialogues, of course, uh, to support our, our ambitions. And uh, for instance, up to 2024, uh, North America is one of the focus regions for us for internationalization. So my topic today is uh, circular economy, because climate emergency is defining everything we do. We work for the rapid green transition and that circular economy as a strategy for all industries to make a shift. Uh, according to the International Circularity Cap Report from 2021 this year. So by combining agendas of circular economy and climate mitigation, we can double the current global circularity rate of 8.6% and thereby cut 39% of total global emissions and 28% of virgin uh, resource use. And this gives us an evidence of the efficiency of uh, circular economy. And this um, circular, circularity cap report also states that although the total potential impact of circular healthcare interventions is small compared to some other uh, societal needs, there are nevertheless multiple benefits to be realized. We at the Nordic Innovation, we talk about sustainable business transformation. And for our health program, it means, for instance, addressing system level changes through data innovation and digitalization for preventive and personalized health services. So sustainability is all about creating long lasting results, not only green, but also with a uh, positive social impact. So we believe in digital integration, inclusion and ecosystem building and using circular economy as a strategy for sustainability. And that by supporting value chain collaboration and helping ecosystem to engage different actors from public and private sector, we can drive that system level changes faster. So circularity is not about material management. It is about economic reasoning, reasoning um, the ways we incorporate strategy in the design of solutions, processes, systems, and governance. So it's about repurposing all these elements of business strategy and about engagement, not only inside a single company or organization, but also in the whole value chain of the company organization, or if we talk about public sector in system level. And we are often asked how the circular economy affects in a business and company level. So measuring impact is important. Triple bottom line is the very key to the sustainable growth. And we see that investors of all sizes require now circularity to a larger extent than before simply because they measure and they can see the benefits. So companies with the circular business models do better than traditional linear companies. So to sum up for our region and the world to become sustainable, we need to implement circular business models for value-based sustainable economic future. I'm looking forward to collaborations. Thank you. And thank you, Nina. Uh, and indeed, uh, in a wider sense, we now turn to a number of cases that will highlight how you do that uh, in a, on a national scale. Uh, we welcome 
uh, first, Gary Gillespie uh, from uh, Scotland, uh, an economist working uh, quite uh, extensively in how to transform this on uh, a, a national scale. Gary, please tell us how you can create uh, from the Nordics, well, um, to at least the UK, the British Isles, uh, that would still be right, the economy of well-being. Okay, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be participate in this session. So I've been asked in my seven minutes to talk about the principles of the well-being economy and what that essentially means. And the next presenter will give a bit more of an application from New Zealand. So I'll give you a flavour. I think it really already of what we mean by that uh, highlights some of that. I think in the context of COVID, and then I'll talk about uh, an initiative we're involved with in Scotland called the Wellbeing Economy Governments. Uh, which essentially is about putting well-being at the heart of all of our policies and how we go about as governments with third party and other stakeholders and trying to ensure that kind of well-being economy approach is embedded in our policies and decision making. So, so what do we mean by well-being economy um, and, and what is this term that um, I'm now talking about? I suppose in a sense, first and foremost, it's a relatively new concept, but it builds on the, a number of um, initiatives and ideas that have been about for a long time, whether it's societal, environmental or whatever. So it kind of builds on that. I think for me, a wellbeing economy is really about a society that thrives across um, economic, social and environmental domains. It's about recognising the interlinkage of how we work, live and relate to our communities and environment. And in that context, it's very similar to... Uh, to the kind of need to take system-wide and system-type perspectives when thinking about well-being from a, a kind of more holistic perspective. Well-being is, does not equate to GDP. I should say that straight away, not even though my role is Chief Economic Advisor within the Scottish Government. Um, it's, it's, it's certainly not that. It's beyond GDP. And it's really about, um, it's really, think as I've seen, thinking about the importance and inter interlinkage between societal, economic, and environmental well-being. And once, from a government perspective, once you've got those frameworks, you can focus on uh, your own well-being priorities within that, whether it's health, education, social protection, equality, or health and social care. So it's really about having a framework that recognises the interlinkages and how that how that acts. And again, the economy is a massive part of that um, and how the economy interacts. Within Scotland, so what you measure matters, I think was said at the beginning, that's really important. In Scotland, we have a national performance framework, which has well-being at its heart. It's about enhancing well-being for the citizens of Scotland. And within that framework, we have a living outcomes uh, covering health, education, justice, environment and the economy. And we also have a vision statement for what type of society we want to be, uh, which was consulted on. And so maybe not surprisingly, people came back and said they wanted a society that respect kindness, trust, dignity, how they wanted to be, uh, how they wanted to be treated. So the economy is obviously massively important in that as well. And basically, and in, in thinking about the economy, um, when their first minister was launching the National Performance Framework, she described uh, essentially, growth is not a means to an end. Essentially, the economy is important in enhancing opportunities, life experience, and not at the expense of our environment, our ecosystems, or biodiversity. So there's a real, a real kind of clear, a clear steer in that. And in thinking about systems perspectives, if you have a national system where you can actually measure what matters, you can then deal with the trade-offs and linkages. If you're if you're interested, our First Minister Nicola Sturgeon uh, did a TED talk in July 2019, that's eight or nine minutes, and she outlines why governments should prioritise well-being. And actually, she goes back to Adam Smith uh, in the late 1700s and talks about the kind of uh, the well-being of citizens and humanity. So it's it's it covers a lot more than I will have time to do in this. But I suppose so. What is the well-being economy? Why is it important? I think there's usually been discussion on these sessions. The pandemic has shown a light on the resilience and well-being of our health systems, individuals, households, 
businesses, public services, and communities in place. So I mean, asking that question about resilience, how resilient are our systems and how do we, how can we kind of build that resi resilience? And that's really, really important. And if you think about it also about how the pandemic is also driving behavioural change and how we live, work, what people value and the preferences that they have now, we've got a real opportunity to think about how we can build a more resilient and collective system which delivers um, delivers well-being. I think, given I've mentioned COVID in Scotland, obviously when we're we're looking at our COVID response, we take what's called a four harms approach. So we look at the immediate harm of the disease in terms of uh, its direct impact. We look at the wider health harms, what's happening in the in the other systems. So, for instance. Um, is it restricting access to other healthcare because we're having to focus on COVID? We look at wider societal harms, loneliness, mental health, social isolation, etc. And we look at the economic harm as well for those that have obviously loss of livelihood, those that have been closed. And then and taking a four harms approach, then when you're thinking about easing restrictions or changing lockdown, it then forces you to have a look through that wider lens. And finally, um, I'll finish on a little bit about the wellbeing economy governments. So Scotland's been a long, on a long journey towards a different approach that integrates the economy with social, health and environmental factors. We have a commitment to net zero and we are obviously, uh, COP26 has been hosted in Glasgow later this year as well. But the wellbeing economy governments was an initiative that was launched in South Korea at the OECD wellbeing conference in late 2018. It was launched by Scotland, Iceland and New Zealand and is also now has Finland and Wales as part of that group. And it's really all, all of these countries have a lot in common. They have frameworks that look to prioritise well-being and they have policies that are aimed at delivering a different type of outcome for their citizens. So the, the well-being economy governments is a platform for us to share. Uh, we have policy labs, we have discussions and we can share practice and policies across those areas to both enhance and enrich a little bit. So really that's just a very quick flavour of the high level principles. A couple of other things just to finish in Scotland. Obviously we are looking at the transition to net zero, uh, the just transition to make sure that we don't do it at the expense of uh, particular uh, groups or, or places. And we're looking at really how we embed better fair work policies within within the economy as well. But I think that's probably my um, seven minutes up. And my final, final thing is really resilience is one of the key lessons that has came out of uh, our experience of COVID and whether that's communities, people, individuals, societies or public services. So I will stop there, Lars, thanks. And thank you, thank you very much. Uh, the, the phrase uh, measure what matters is uh, something that you've heard a few times so far uh, and th this is quite apt I guess um, Gary's good colleague uh, joining us from New Zealand we are indeed going very global today or rather I'd say this morning uh, <laughs> because obviously in New Zealand it's it's quite early um, and as luck will have it um, you might not know it but um, this is actually a Dane talking to a Dane across the globe <laughs> Thank you, Kirsten, and thank you for joining us um, on more about how to measure what matters, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, Lars. Um, it is indeed very early here in New Zealand, and um, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I would like to share um, a few insights and experiences we've had here in New Zealand. Um, so I'm looking at it from a public finance uh, government point of view. Um, last, can I just check, are you sharing the slides? Do you want me to share the slides? Uh, you can tr share the slides so that you can control the transition okay. as well. Okay, let me just... Um, actually, if you could do it, that would be brilliant. Um, if you don't mind. Two sex. Thank you. So... Um, Yes, yeah, so I've got a background um, 30 years in working in government in New Zealand um, and um, I work at the Treasury 
and we have been um, very central to the way that we've been thinking about well-being and policy in New Zealand. And um, one of the reasons why it might be interesting for people to have a look at what we're doing in New Zealand is that New Zealand has got a history of um, being very early movers in terms of um, social change. Last, the next slide, please. So um, there's been a number of things um, that's quite important for New Zealand when we're thinking about social change. And one of them is recognizing that we really need to work with others. Um, so um, we need to take an international um, approach. In terms of COVID, um, just to give people a bit of a sense of the approach that we've taken here in New Zealand, um, it's been very much one of going hard and going early, um, taking quite a precautionary approach. And um, one thing which is particularly interesting from a social change point of view is there's very much been um, an approach of a team of 5 million and we only, five million people in New Zealand. So it's basically uh, the team of the nation. Um, and I think that's an important part of how do we actually think about um, social change. Next slide, please. What um, we have been doing here in New Zealand in terms of thing about well-being economics and well-being from, from a treasury point of view. Um, we've been working on what we call living standards and a living standards framework for quite a number of years. And um, in 2017, um, the New Zealand government picked up this framework as a way of shifting the focus from a very strong GDP focus to saying, actually, there's a lot more than GDP and a strong economic focus um, that matters when we think about policy and when we think about well-being. So there's a number of different domains and I can highly recommend that people have a look at the excellent work that the OECD has been doing for um, quite a few years now. And <clears throat> excuse me, and um, we in New Zealand, we've built the framework on that. There's a number of areas that are very common across um, countries in terms of what matters. Um, and the main point here is that it's not something where it only focuses on one thing. Um, there's many things that matters to us in terms of well-being. Um, in New Zealand, um, we've got 12 um, domains, well-being domains that we're looking at, um, which is about measuring um, well-being at a point in time. And also we think about um, what are the things that's going to be the sources of well-being in the future. So that's what we call the well-being capitals. Again, we see them as interwoven. Um, so a system that supports future well-being. We have developed a number of indicators in relation to these, but also there's a number of different indicator sets, um, most importantly from Statistics New Zealand, um, that provides us information about just how are we going as a country. Um, next slide, please. There are many different ways of looking at well-being, and we we're certainly aware of that, um, acutely aware of that here in New Zealand. And in particular, um, we might think that the the OECD work um, and the way that we've articulated the living standards framework doesn't necessarily capture. Um, the perspective from a more indigenous um, view. So we are also doing work on developing um, a Maori wellbeing framework, and it does have some different elements to it um, than what we see in the living standards framework. 
and we're working with both when we're thinking about um, policy. So um, even though we've used the OECD as a base, it's not the only thing that we're looking at. So again, that kind of thinking about it from multiple perspectives and that there's several elements in well-being is quite important. Next slide, please. So why is it important to, to take a look at um, well-being in a wider sense? And um, COVID is actually quite a good example of that because COVID, you know, you might think about, well, it's all about saving lives and saving jobs. Um, and that's certainly a key focus of what we're doing. But it, it is quite important to be aware um, when we're looking at policy changes, um, what are the wider implications of some of those policy changes um, and options? And um, to take one, um, mental health um, is something that's been um, very, very key in terms of how it's affecting, um, you know, say, for example, lockdowns or um, um, whether, um, you know, what kind of social distancing people have to observe um, in society um, can affect both mental health, social connections, a whole variety of different elements of how we think about our well-being. So um, the framework, um, the living standards framework, we had used that as, as part of thinking about the policy options for COVID. And it's a really good um, prompt for thinking about it really, really broadly when you think about well-being. So this is just one example, and um, people can have a look at a discussion paper. Um, if you're interested in having um, a deeper dive into that. But there are quite a few different ways that we can look at the well-being impacts of um, policy options, for example, in relation to, to COVID. So um, really useful for thinking broad and thinking uh, longer term as well. Next slide, please. So how might we use it when we think about um, public money and budgets and all of that kind of stuff? Um, that's actually been really central to how we have made well-being real in, in New Zealand. Um, it has indeed been um, in budget decision making that um, it's been very prominent, um, the whole concept of well-being in a very broad sense. And um, the way that we have used it has been both in terms of um, the living standards framework and forming how we think about um, the priorities. Um, so they informed the budget priorities in, in budget 2019 um, and has been informing um, how we think about priorities since then. Um, but also um, there's now some new requirements. Um, so we've changed our Public Finance Act in New Zealand and um, this requires the government to both set and explain um, how the well-being objectives of the government um, will um, guide the budget decisions. Um, in addition to that, there's a new requirement on the Treasury to provide a well-being report um, if, at least every four years. And um, that the first one of that is going to be in 2022. I'll now switch into um, the more micro level. So we've been looking at sort of a, in a broader sense um, how we use the, the frameworks and thinking broad. Now we can look at also specific initiatives. So I'm just going to give you a few tasters of what that might look like. Um, next slide, please. So 
when we are looking at specific initiatives within the budget process, or say, for example, if we're looking at new um, legislation or regulations, we can take um, a well-being approach to how we think about those initiatives and the impacts of those initiatives. And again, there's a couple of things that um, flow through that. One is thinking really broadly about those impacts um, and also thinking much more longer term. So this is just an example of the kind of templates that can be used to prompt people um, when they're providing information for budget decision making around what are the areas or the domains of well-being that's affected. Um, also thinking about um, who is affected, the magnitude of it, timing in the evidence base. And um, I'll probably leave it at that because I think uh, my time is probably about out. But um, the main thing here is that there's ways of um, making this real in policy and budget decision making. So it doesn't have to be something fluffy that we can't get our hands on. We can indeed um, use numbers. Um, we can um, look at different ways of um, getting better information about the impacts that we're having on people's lives, which is um, what is really central to when we are making um, policy and budget decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kirsten. And indeed, actually, um, and directly related to that, uh, we'll proceed with uh, a presentation from Carolyn White of Ireland, um, talking about how to actually make this happen, because of course you don't uh, just start off uh, having the finance ministry working for you. Um, you have to go slow, you have to go steady, and you have to start bottom up. Caroline, please tell us how you're doing it right now uh, by establishing a wellbeing hub. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Um, my name is Caroline White. I'm an ecological economist and I work for FASTA, the Foundation for the Economics of Sustainability. And we are proud members of the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, which is related to what several other speakers have mentioned. Gary mentioned the We Go movement of wellbeing governments. And the Alliance is, um, it's not the same as We Go, but it's its an influencing, uh, influencing partner, if you like, and um, it's very active. So I'll explain a bit about that in a minute. I'll just quickly explain about what FASTA is first. FASTA is the organization I work for. It's an Irish word and it means in the future. And um, we are very much focused on um, trying to bring about a sustainable economy using a systems approach. So we don't consider mistakes or problems necessarily being coming from bad people behaving badly, but more on the system level, which again has been touched on by many people already. And the word faster is actually very evocative in Ireland. It comes from a poem, an old Irish poem, which is a kind of lament for deforestation, biodiversity loss, and the widespread disempowerment of the poor that used that was happening in the past in Ireland in the 18th century. And it ends with a yearning. And I find this very interesting in the, in the context of the pandemic, um, the yearning fires and violin music. And to me, these are some of the things that people are missing during the pandemic and some of the things that we would maybe associate with a well-being economy. Um, so um, we have members all over the world, actually, even though we're Irish based, and I'm going to be talking about Ireland in a minute, but um, we also have a very active group in North America, for example. And um, maybe if I can just either put up my slides or Lars, if you have, uh, would you like to put, use my slides or how should we do it? I don't know what's best. Um, I'm going to whirl through them really, really fast. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Can, two seconds, Carolyn. If you like, I could share them, I don't mind, you know. Oh, oh yeah, there we go, brilliant, thanks, that's great. I'll just, um, okay, you can actually go ahead because I've done that bit and the next slide is just a forest, uh, a forest in Ireland. You carry on please, next one. 
Um, great, okay. So uh, we are very interested in the connections between health, the economy and the environment, and we collaborate quite a lot with the European Health Futures Forum, which David Somek already spoke about earlier. Um, just to give a quick example, we had a joint podcast in November. We have a whole podcast series actually called Bridging the Gaps. And we had one in November, which was two, had two expert speakers, um, Una Duggan and Eastkey Britain, talking about the two publications that you can see there on the screen. And in some ways, I think the connections between health, environment and economy are kind of obvious. I mean, we all know clean air in our lungs, you know, if we have healthy lungs, we work better and so on. That kind of thing is obvious. But sometimes I think it's very interesting to just drill down, look at the real figures behind some of this. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, for example, in the UK, there's been some very interesting research about um, the benefits, um, David talked earlier about un unintentional consequences, and sometimes unintentional consequences of investments are actually positive, not only negative. For example, we all know that if we do less driving, we use cars less, we do more cycling, more walking, it's good for the environment, pollution, it brings down emissions for greenhouse gases, that kind of thing. However, they've done some interesting research that shows that for every one unit of money, say pounds, euros, dollars, that you put into improving walking and cycling infrastructure, you end up saving five and a half times as much money, which is staggering. I mean, it's such a good investment. It's such a win-win. And that money is being saved on things like um, accidents that aren't happening, um, all the energy and money that goes into car infrastructure, um, congestion and so on. So these are all things that work very well together, but there's a slight catch. And now can we go to the next slide, please? The next, the slight catch is that those things don't necessarily contribute to GDP growth because things like um, accidents and so on, well, the weird way that GDP growth is measured means that things like accidents and uh, use of energy and so on, they all add to growth. Um, so there's, there's something strange about the measurement and several people before us, before me have talked about how it's very important to measure what matters. In FASTA, we're very interested in what's called the donut economy, which is on this diagram here, you can see it's the pale green circle in the middle. We didn't come up with this idea. It was an economist called Kate Raworth. But the idea is to adjust the economy so that we our health needs are met, our money, uh, sorry, our food, our water, all of that, we have enough money to. Uh, that's the social foundation. And the outside of the donut is ecological ceiling. And that's, we don't want to go past that. We want to have an economy that fits well within those limits. And so this is our goal for Ireland and for elsewhere as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so we have a theory of change. I'm not going to go into great detail about this, but just very briefly, we've, we basically, we think the toe nut needs three main supports in order to work. And if you take one of them away, it will fall over. All of these things are interconnected as we've talked about, as other people have mentioned. And so um, next slide, please. Um, we've, we basically, if you like, um, if you're curious about any of this, have a look on our website, Theory of Change on FASTA.org. We have a whole bunch of short, medium and long term preconditions that we think are necessary to help the economy to become a donut economy. OK, so this is all on our website. Next slide, please. And we have tons and tons of publications as well, which are all free for download. And again, I'm not going to read them all out because I know I haven't a lot of time. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to now talk about we all in more detail because we are, as I mentioned, we're part of the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. And in Ireland, we are forming what's called the Wellbeing Economy Hub. And this is a, a group of organizations that are working together. And we take both a top-down and a bottom-up approach simultaneously. Um, the bottom-up approach has to do with um, spreading awareness and, and helping to generate more discussion about what way we want the economy to go, what kind of um, things should be being measured, um, how it can be reoriented more towards well-being. And the, the top-down is more to do with encouraging both the Irish government in the South and the Republic and the Northern government to become more oriented in this way as well. They've both made good sound in that direction, which is great. And they're both working in that way, in, in that orientation. We, what we would love would be if they would eventually join the We Go Wellbeing Governments group, that would be brilliant. So we're working hard on both levels for those things. We have two very active partners within Ireland who are working on the hub with us. Um, can I have the next slide, please? One minute, Caroline. Sure, sure, no problem. So basically we have, we've established these goals all together and uh, they're, they're quite high level as you can see. So 
they very much fit in with what previous speakers have mentioned, really. We'd like to shift narratives around the purpose of our economy from a simplistic model of growth to a holistic socio-ecological approach. And I think that fits in very well with what Gary and Kirsten were saying about how GDP isn't an end, you know, it's not a measure of success, well-being in itself, that it doesn't bring it about in itself. We'd have what Kate Rayworth would call a growth agnostic stance, you know, where we would like the economy to be able to function in a way that's not dependent on growth and there may be growth and that's great because we don't actually need it you know other things are important as well or you know and also we'd like to disseminate knowledge across the economy as i already mentioned and you know um, a bottoms up approach uh, also we'd like to have an island wide approach that's very important for us uh, which really takes into account different perspectives the history of ireland the very rich and varied culture of ireland in all different parts of ireland and um the different resources that there are for inspiration there. So next slide, please, that's the last one. Oh, sorry. No problem. Okay, so I'll just finish now with, um, if you're curious or would like to know more about our hub, how it's going, if you'd like to reach out, because we're now at a point where we're looking for other people who might be interested, you know, in, in joining with what we're doing. So please give us a, a, drop me an email. My email address is there. Have a look at the FASTA site for more information about FASTA. And uh, this picture here is actually, it's from 2019. It's pre-pandemic. It's from a FASTA event that we had uh, with some partners called Food for Thought, Lon and Tine, which is the Irish, Irish for that. And um, partnership is terribly important to us in, in FASTA. And I, for me, this photo kind of evokes the things that were in the poem I mentioned earlier, the need for music, for enjoying each other, for having fun, for an economy that's oriented to really to well-being in, in that very wide sense, and also looking after nature and nature looking after us. So thank you very much, and I'll pass it back. Thanks a lot, Lars. That was a tour de force, certainly. Uh, and thank you very much uh, again uh, to Caroline and to Gary and indeed also Kirsten. Um, David, uh, a few thoughts on this tour de force uh, through the well-being economy. There's so much, isn't there? <laughs> I think that uh, all I could say in the time we've got really is to say that what we're learning here is uh, very much about uh, society as an ecosystem, how things are connected, and really very valuable to look at the way uh, the economists, uh, or the, the ones that they, if you like, are the leading edge, are uh, uh, looking at the needs of society. That's the whole concept of the well-being economy, and, and there are guys putting it into practice, uh, their colleagues. Now, what we want to do now really is flip it now, instead of looking at um, how the economy helps to look at uh, society's different needs, we're going to look at the health ecosystem. And here we're calling on Ian Kendrick uh, from <coughs> H3 University um, to talk about a futures perspective. Uh, uh, and uh, look, straight over to you, Ian. Your mic. I think you're muted, uh, Ian. Now I'm unmuted. Can you hear me okay? Can now, yep. Yep. And can you see the shared screen, Three Horizons Review? Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Lars and David. Um, my role now is to take you through the work that we have done in EHFF, looking at, as David points out, the, the, the overall European health ecosystem using the Three Horizons approach. To introduce Three Horizons, we've actually asked Bill Sharp, who's one of the original uh, co-authors of Three Horizons, to explain exactly what Three Horizons is and how it works. That will give us the context. I'll then come back in and take us through the work that we have done. What we've done is we've dived deep into the complexity of the European health ecosystem and the other systems with which it has to interact through a Three Horizons lens. So if I go here now and go like this and go start. Thank you, Lars and David. I'm very pleased to be with you all today. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you in person. Ian has asked me to give you an overview of Three Horizons and how that fits into the broader field of futures practice. So I'd like to share my screen with you. If we're thinking about the future, most basic 
property, the most basic quality of the future. If you ask anyone, what do you think about the future? What quality comes to mind? The first thing they're going to say is that it's uncertain. So any approach to working on the future has to deal with this fundamental quality of not knowing what it is and how that turns up for us, whether it turns up as risk or opportunity or whatever, unknown unknowns, whatever, but uncertainty. But there's a sort of paradox that even though we don't know what the future is going to be, at every moment as we act, we are taking a view on the future. We are exercising some sort of agency with respect to that uncertainty, taking a view on whether it's going to turn out the way we, we think or not. So the other basic dimension of working on the future is the sort of agency that we adopt towards that uncertainty. And we can draw this as a basic two by two of approaches. Down in the bottom left hand corner here is the, is the world where if, if we can use the past as a reasonable model of the future, then we can make plans and forecasts. This is the world where the past gives us a realistic model of the future and we can use probabilistic methods, we can use measures of certainty and uncertainty, and the sort of forecasts we get will be typically a low one, a high one, and something in the middle. So this is the everyday world of budgeting and forecasting, and even though these things are usually wrong at some level, uh, they, they are adequate for everyday purposes. And this is not the field of futures practice. So futures practice deals with situations where the past is not an adequate guide to the future where we have to work with it in a qualitative way rather than a quantitative one and handle the scope of uncertainty relevant to what we're doing. So in the fields of futures practice, there are two main methods that have grown up historically. The first and perhaps the best known is scenario planning or strategic thinking with scenarios. Many of you be familiar with this, the basic idea of scenario planning is to accept the uncertainty in the world and the fact that the easiest way to hold that in mind is a set of stories. So the idea of scenario planning is to take all the uncertainties to which our field of interest is subject, break it down maybe into two or three dominant uncertainties that we plot on a couple of axes like that, and then tell a distinct story that's plausible and compelling about each of those possible futures and use those like wind tunnel, like a wind tunnel to test our agency against it. So we take our own ability to shape the future out, look at what the world might be, and then put ourselves back in and say, well, how would, how would things turn out for us in these diff different futures? So scenarios leave your agency to one side while you work on these possible futures. The other place you can go is to the opposite extreme and try and move the uncertainty out to the perimeter of, of things and build a roadmap. And the idea of a roadmap, particularly loved by the technology industry, is to pool the agency of many different players, many different actors, so that by all agreeing and pooling their purpose, they can remove many dimensions of uncertainty. And that will be typically uh, done, say, as I said, in technology areas like our mobile phones, but also in negotiations um, like peace roadmaps, where if everyone agrees to take a certain step together, then from that point they can step forward. The area that's been less developed but is now coming into view is this top right area where we want to adopt a position of agency, bringing many different parties together, but also accepting fundamental dimensions of uncertainty, which mean we have to adopt an incremental, growing, adaptive approach where we take steps into the uncertainty, see what reveals itself, and then take new steps according to that. And we're increasingly adopting the term pathways for this segment and maybe calling them adaptive pathways to capture this notion that we have to be constantly bringing our sense of intent and purpose into play, but constantly adapting to the contextual situation as it changes. So there is a, a sense of asserting our own direction, but adapting to the changing situation. And this is the, the domain where we've been particularly bringing in the three horizon approach that, that I'll describe now. There are of course other approaches that you can use in that segment. Um, the advantage of three horizons we found is that scenario planning and scenario thinking is a very powerful method, but you have to start from scratch every time. 
and it takes quite a lot of work before you get any, any result back. And it doesn't in itself inform action. The advantage of Three Horizons is that it takes you into the realm of uncertainty and thinking about the future very quickly. You can get some sort of conversation going in a couple of hours and it is intrinsically oriented to action. So it's in, oriented to this reflexive nature of futures and adaptive pathways that the steps you take are going to change the landscape. So it's a good tool for getting into action on an uncertain future in the face of complexity very quickly. So the basic idea of Three Horizons is really simple. We draw time along here and we choose a period of time appropriate to the to the issue in hand and we put pattern up here meaning a more friendly word than system but what we're thinking of is what's the dominant pattern at any particular time if we're having a three horizon discussion then it means what we call the first horizon is the business as usual at a particular time today it's where we are today it's the patterns of life that we're all relying on but that there is some changing landscape within which that's operating, which means that the first horizon is losing its fit to the future. There is an open, a gulf opening up between the way things we're doing things now and the evolving landscape. And if that's the case, it means that we can anticipate that as we look to the future, a new pattern is going to come into being, either because it, it's done by our own intent or other issues are going to going to force the change upon us. So the third horizon is the imagined possible future that will come into being. And between the two is the land, is the arena of change and turbulence, which we refer to as the second horizon. So it's a very simple model, just business as usual in the first horizon, an emerging third horizon that will eventually become the new normal and a domain of change and turbulence in the, in the second horizon. What makes this really land with people and be very powerful is that as well as describing the, the world out there, they describe these three different orientations, these three different ways of acting that we have in the present moment towards the future. So we can think of them as three qualities of the future in the present moment. The distinctive quality of the first horizon we describe as the management outlook, being a manager, being responsible. And we all know what it feels like to have to be responsible for something in our family or our work and the way we expect other people to take responsibility for a pattern and maintain its integrity because we can't check everything so we rely on a certain quality of behavior in people who maintain the current pattern. This is completely different to the visionary approach to the third horizon. By definition the third horizon hasn't come into being so we can't see it out there we can only see it by using our own imagination. So we bring the future into the present by holding it as a vision from which we inform the action that we take moment by moment. While we can expect somebody else to behave as a manager, nobody can have that ex expectation of us with respect to a vision. A vision represents a personal commitment to a certain sort of future. Other people may agree with it or disagree with it, but we hold it as a possibility in mind and progressively then perhaps try to enrol other people into it. The nature of the visionary, the, the second horizon is the entrepreneurial quality. So informed by a vision or a sense of opportunity, the, the entrepreneur is making a move to bring about some change. Maybe they're not quite sure where that's heading, but they're grasping a sense of opportunity. They're moving into that space and inherently trying to enroll people into that change. So the basic idea, the most simple idea of three horizons is that it's three distinctive qualities of the future in the present. And they're all dimensions of what we like to call future consciousness an awareness of the future potential of the present moment and how we therefore choose to relate to it. The third dimension, we've talked about the outer dimension, gives us a way of looking at the world of the change. The inner orientation is this one to which voice am I using, which mode of acting am I adopting. But the third quality is how we relate to one another. And once we see these as three different perspectives on the future and the present, we can see that when they come into dialogue, they often talk at cross purposes. One of the most useful things we find in Three Horizons 
is that if people see these as three necessary voices in the room, then instead of the visionary thinking the manager is just a dinosaur and the manager just thinking the visionary is out to lunch and flaky, they can see that all three voices are needed. And while they won't necessarily disagree, they can at least disagree in a rather more intelligent way and see that all three voices have a role to play. So I'd like to give an example of this in the slides. And um, I think Ian is going to take you through now an example of how we've used this and the very basic process that we always start with of going first to the first horizon. What, what are the current failures or difficulties with that? Then we move to the third horizon and paint a picture of that envisioned world. And then we start to explore in the second horizon what innovations are beginning to disrupt the landscape and might be growth points of the future. But I'll hand over to Ian now, who's going to take you through the rest of the <coughs> presentation and, and thank you for allowing me to be with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Bill Shop. That was recorded yesterday and we've had a bit of a change of plan this afternoon. So rather than me talking about the example that, uh, that Bill was going to talk about and then talk about the work we're doing with the HFF, I'm going to take us straight to the work that the European Health Futures Forum has done uh, using this Three Horizons approach, exactly as Bill has described, to actually inquire about the European health ecosystem, its current Horizon 1, uh, it's losing its fitness for purpose. It's horizon three, what we're trying to get to, and then coming to the all important horizon two, which is where transformation actually takes place. What we did was produce a survey for members of EHFF to complete, inquiring about their view of the current horizon, the horizon they'd like to get to, the aspirational horizon of the horizon three of what the European health ecosystem would look like after it's been transformed, and what's that messy state in the middle, that transformation process? We got over 600 individual distilled answers. So this is a pretty deep dive into the complexity of the health ecosystem. It's not scratching the surface. We're trying to go rather deeper than that. At Horizon 1, we had 283 uh, individual answers. That was 47%. Horizon 2 is 128, which is that much. And Horizon 3 was 192. On day 192 as well, yeah, Horizon 3 is 32%. Those ratios are relatively normal. If you ask somebody what they think about the current state of the world, they're normally more informed than they are about the world they'd like to get to and how to get there. So that's not unusual. There's a team, which was Christine, Lars, Sean, Sean uh, Noel, David and Matthijs uh, focused on the work. This is work over uh, actually quite a few months of work to actually go into this. What I'm going to do is show you as quickly as I can uh, the work that was done. We start out by producing a Three Horizons map that looks like this. And it was rather pointed out rather ironically, it looks like viruses. Uh, what this is, which you uh, don't expect you to be able to read this, the blobs are clusters and the little squares around the outside are the individual answers. What I'm gonna do is zoom into this top left-hand corner, which is our Horizon 1, and zoom into that to show you the kind of results that we got. And here it is. This is that top left corner of Horizon 1. And the first question was, so what do you see around you right now? that shows that the current health ecosystem is under strain. And we get things like burnout, the system is failing, the situation in the UK is not good, gaps in mental care delivery, public alienation from clinicians, gaps and lack of coordination and care, well-being and prevention is a serious issue. Look how many there are around that. And this thing, the uncertainty of impact is related, related to COVID. Each of these squares around the outside is one of the responses. So let's look closer at this one, uncertainty of impact related to COVID. Here it is. These are the actual results, by the way. This is the real work. This is not an example. This is the real work that we are doing right now. So I'm not sure how well you can read this. So I'll read through a few of these. Around the outside, number 17 here. Incidentally, number 17 is all of those 602 answers had, uh, had, uh, had uh, numbers on them so that we can go back to that work. So that when we're asked, tell us about this uncertainty of the impact related to COVID, we can go deeper and back to where we started from and then come forward again. So we can answer questions with, a degree of detail rather than just broad brush strokes. Okay, so number seventeen is a disastrous attempt at developing and implementing a track and trace capability. We've got misguided support for the homegrown ventilators by Dyson and JCB. That's taking us back to the early days of the pandemic. Uncertainty with the next wave of COVID and so on. These are the kind of responses that we got. And the idea here is that all these have been done by different folk from the EHFF community, but they're all in there. 
and they all get used and they all get included. Nothing is taken out, quite the opposite. Everything is included. So we get the richest possible view that we can get. Let's look at one more here. Failure to address climate change as a major issue. On the left-hand side here, the advent of diseases typically associated with tropic regions. Over here on the right-hand side, the way animals are treated impacts health, economy, environment, etc. Okay, so we're actually, this is all coming in. Climate change and the like is coming into our three horizons now. What I'm gonna do is go very quickly to this bit, which is where we take out the little, the, the little squares around the outside and just use the cluster titles. And then what we do is to try and understand what is happening systemically in each of these three horizons. Incidentally, the top left here, this is horizon one. The pink and red ones are horizon one. Over here on the right-hand side is horizon three. I will be going into more depth about the questions that we asked, by the way, that will come clear. But what down, this one down here, right at the bottom left here, this is what is present in 2020 as it was in 2021 right now, that is actually of the horizon that we're trying to get to, it's already existing. When Bill Sharp said, all three horizons are present all the time. Imagine if you did a time band going vertically along here, you would see that actually there are aspects of horizon one, horizon two, horizon three are always co-present. Then we get to this, which is where we try and understand the linkages between all the, these things that are going on. And you can see over here on the right-hand side, it's complex. The systemic patterns are complex, but that's what we have to work with if we are to actually enable transformation to take place. If we look here, We've got a loop which, which is difficult for you to read, but it says the failure to address the elephants, which is climate change and inequality gaps. And down here, a lack of long-term vision leading to system collapse. What I'm gonna do is very quickly take you on to the overview of each of these horizons. Here's the overview. Horizon one, what's horizon one all about? Well, at the center, we've got an inadequate long-term vision has generated the horizon that we're in right now. The long-term vision was not, was, was just inadequate. And actually it's still inadequate. So it's actually maintaining that current horizon. So what we have is overall health ecosystem failure. We have failure to address major societal issues, including inequality gaps and climate change. Where are we trying to get to with horizon three? Remember Bill said, we always go horizon one, horizon three, horizon two. Horizons one and three provides some of the bookends for horizon two in the center. What we envisage is that in Horizon 3, we need future awareness at the heart of it, almost the opposite of an adequate long-term vision. And we need future awareness facilitating adaptation as part of the new culture to continuously evolve and improve health and well-being, not just to provide a snapshot health system that, that works with what is present now, but actually it continuously evolves and adapts and changes. So we need resilient ecosystems supported by health literacy and transformed education. Those two topics, we need improved health literacy and transformed education were, were major items in what came through in the survey. And it needs to be enabled and connected by digital technology and services with data authenticity, transparency and personal control. Okay. What's the, happening in the center though, Horizon 2 to actually enable this journey to take place? What came out very strongly is that there needs to be a mobilization of social movements and cultural values to drive change. It needs to come from the ground up and the health, the health ecosystem has to uh, engage with that to generate an emerging planetary health agenda. Now, what I'm gonna do now is take us through those at three horizons. And you saw the systemic loops and diagrams with arrows connecting things. It's complex to look at. We wanted something that we could make easier to, to, to grapple with and cleaner. And, and we, I, we found a graphic design, designer to help with that who came up with the idea of picturing it as a railway system with stations and railway tracks connecting the things together. So it sort of looks like that. Let's have a look at it. Here's our horizon one. Overall health ecosystem failure, as we said in the overview, and the failure to address major societal issues, including inequality gaps and climate change. Survey questions. One, what do you see around you that is evidence that the current European health ecosystem is under strain right now? Question two, what do you see that demonstrates a decreasing fit between the European health ecosystem and the current and emerging conditions such as economic, climate, political, and any other factors that impact on society? And thirdly, what aspect of the European health ecosystem do you see that must be maintained, carried forward, and even amplified? Here is what we saw at the center of it, inadequate long-term vision, as we said in our summary point. That has led 
to health and well-being strategies that aren't properly prioritized, but there's no mutual recognition between those strategies and the long-term vision. That inadequate long-term vision also produces inequality, the lack of solidarity to bridge the apparent gaps in the inequality. It produces service delivery gaps and lack of service delivery. It doesn't identify and prioritize innovation. There's reluctance to embrace new knowledge and technology, and that is slowing down innovation. Those strategies that are health and well-being not well prioritized is producing major constraints because there's a lack of resources and collaboration, all heads back to the inadequate long-term vision. But those constraints can create the service delivery gaps and the service delivery gaps create the constraints. There's a, there's a mutual interaction going on there. And those constraints lead to reluctance to embrace the new knowledge and the technology and that slows innovation. The inequality creates lack of confidence to adopt the innovation. Lack of solidarity, so that inequality, I don't want to adopt this new innovation and new knowledge. And that lack of embracing new knowledge and technology maintains the inequality, another it's a deadly embrace again. Ironically, up right hand side here is alienation. There's a decrease in trust and clarity, which is leading to alienation. That service delivery is increasing the inequality and the increase in quality is inevitably leading to the alienation. And the service delivery gaps is increasing the alienation. This huge decrease in trust and clarity and alienation. That is reducing the adoption of the innovation, but is also generating the constraints or making the constraints worse. And the innovation is creating gaps in service delivery. And if you look around the outside, there's a big loop reinforcing itself. That's what we see in Horizon 1. And going through it at this speed, it's difficult for everybody to absorb, completely understand that. Maybe we can publish this and allow you to look at it in more detail. But bear in mind behind this is all those results that we got from our survey. Horizon 3, what does that look like? Now, what would a transformed world, resilient ecosystems, enabled and connected by digital technology. These are the questions we asked. One, imagine you're in a time machine, you go forward to 2030, you open the doors. What do you now see around you that shows that the European health ecosystem is well aligned with the current and emerging needs of society as a whole? And how does that ecosystem relate to the other systems with which it interacts or by which it is influenced? And how have they shifted in this own intervening time? Because they haven't stood still either. And thirdly, what do you see around you right now, today, in 2021? To look and feel like the kind of initiatives that indicate that some aspects of the future are already here. Once you do your future casting for your Horizon 3 and say, well, it needs to look like that. Now look around. You will always find, not just with the health ecosystem, other work that we're doing, you will always find pockets of the future in the present. The core to Horizon 3, as far as we can see, is we need a future awareness that is facilitated adaptation as part of the new culture to continuously evolve and improve health and well-being. The future awareness, it's the opposite of the, the, an inadequate long-term vision that actually, that actually generated the horizon that we're in right now. That future awareness is the context for this, transformed education and health literacy. We need fit for purpose healthcare education of the professionals towards flexible roles, coaching and prevention. It's a tr transformation takes place. We need health literacy, health literacy, literacy societies which promote and maintain health and well-being. That future awareness with, with a new culture to continuously evolve it provides the context for that. It also makes real the responsibility, integrated personal and community responsibility of health and care. That new culture, that, that future awareness makes that real. It demands health and economy, and it demands health and ecology, economy and ecology, uh, uh, research of the home and management of the home, eco mini home. Health and economy, we need a balance between health and economy supported by new economic models and health values. Health and ecology, we need a holistic approach to health that respects and values I'll repeat that, that respects and values the environment. That responsibility will justify that health and economy and health and ecology. Top left, the transformed education and health literacy helps the emergence of that personal community responsibility. And health and economy and health and ecology provides practical support for that responsibility. It also develops persistence for this future awareness. 
we have to keep reinforcing that we have to have that future awareness that we're always looking to shift and change. In the comment before with this, in the chat box, before was a notion about sort of continuous adaptation. That's really at the heart of this. Responsibility provides the courage to generate this future awareness and the health literacy develops and encourages it. The transformed education and health literacy encourages and demands a health economy and health ecology. And guess what? The last arrow, the health economy, a health economy justifies and reinforces the transformed education and the health literacy. So we see systemic loops reinforcing themselves here. Now, all of that is to get us to horizon two. So how is this transformational journey actually gonna take place? What's happening in the horizon two between these two worlds? Let's go to horizon two. Survey question. What current initiatives do you feel could enable the transition out of our horizon one and help produce our horizon three ecosystem? What current initiatives are the present now that we can reinforce? And what initiatives do you feel need to be started that aren't present, that need to start them, that would lead out of horizon one and towards horizon three. At the core of this is this notion of mobilization of social movements and cultural values to drive change. We need to mobilize. That will influence sustainable health, enhance community, enhance community action and empowerment towards sustainable health and well-being. that whole mobilization of social movements and cultures. It stimulates this new culture, increased health literacy through a new culture of education. And that, this is reflecting what we want to see in the third horizon. And it encourages the sustainable development goals. There's a change in political and economic priorities and incentives towards the SDGs and health and well-being. It insists upon execution. This is not, this is not a thought experiment. This mobilization has to execute, an execution of an integrated health and well-being system that works. And it enables strategies and solutions. Remember that in, in, in Horizon One, that actually that lack of uh, long-term, the adequate long-term vision had not generated proper strategies. Now we want increased people-centered digital strategies and solutions. That new culture at the top drives sustainable health. It reinforces the sustainable development goals, which go back and, reach and shape the culture, reinforcing the loop again there. And the new culture enables this mobilization of social movements, another reinforcing loop. And the strategy and solution at the bottom actually enable execution and support execution. Strategy and solutions, they enhance this new culture. And lastly, the SDGs bring about the execution. Now we draw a dotted blue box around that. That's what we think our horizon two looks like. But you may recall that we asked two things. We asked one thing of horizon three which is what can you see as the pockets of the future and the present? Well, if they're present and they're the pockets of the future, they are energies that we can connect to and they're energies that we can draw upon to reinforce what we're trying to do in this Horizon 2 world. Here it is. There's awareness of need for change out there already, supporting vulnerable groups and better health literacy. That we can connect to mobilization of social movements. This is how we can actually get started. We also know there's a growth of telehealth and its implications. So we've made there's, there's systems and resources. We know there's, there's a need for it and we know that they're lacking, but there's an energy to actually do something about it. That will help us with the mobilization of, of this social, of this culture. There's a changing agenda top right now about the SDGs, changing the agenda. Well-being economy and SDGs are being given greater priority. That can help us with that aspect of Horizon 2. Left here, look, now we've got a red. Now the red, is one of the aspects of Horizon One that we really would like to keep and maintain and maybe even amplify. Ownership, there's increased stakeholder collaboration and community ownership. This is vitally important. This notion of community is really important at the macro level and the local level, the Cosmo local as it's called. And the citizen is from Horizon Three. Look where Horizon One and Horizon Three meet here with citizen engagement. So citizen engagement is vitally important which leads us towards sustainable health. At the top here, in Horizon One, we have a culture that values knowledge and education. It is there. Work and education and knowledge, if we can connect those from the Horizon One world to generate this new culture, that will help us bring it into being. Lastly, bottom right here, universal health coverage with international support. Already in Horizon One, we're starting to get this notion of universal health coverage with international support, and we're starting to get international systems integration. That's 
the horizon two that we see. And I, that, that's, that's the end of the slides, by the way. So I'm going to wrap up very quickly because we're over time. There is a concept I'd like to just uh, land with us all. It's the notion of a catalyst. And a couple of years ago, there was a paper produced called the, uh, the World of the Field Catalyst, which is an entity that catalyzes a field. It actually helps connect things together. It provides the roadmaps. It provides the routes. It provides this kind of work that we are doing and connects together the players on the field to actually transform that field. That has been updated very recently by a couple of very close colleagues of mine, Steve Waddell and Sandra Waddick, who put forward a paper that's just about to be published on a transformational catalyst. And in EHFF, we talked about the notion of EHF actually being a transformational catalyst and to catalyze this transformation. This is the work that we've been doing. This is absolutely current. I'm going to hand back to, uh, oh, that's just the, uh, that's the, the summary piece again, out of time. I'm going to hand back to Lars and David, and I hope that's been helpful. Terrific, uh, Ian, thanks. But yes, it's a huge rush because it's so complex and yet it's so rich. And we're, we realize that we've taken up uh, Jim's time too and that he'll be waiting to wrap up. But um, the fact is, uh, very grateful indeed to all our panelists. We'd love to have had a long discussion about all this. Time is too short as ever. But as I, the, <coughs> the, uh, <clears throat> the warning on the packet was uh, each week has been, this is a tasting menu. We want to make, we want to stimulate your palates, but we don't have time to give you the full meal. That will come later, we hope. So thank you very much indeed uh, from both of us and uh, to all of you and we'll hand back to Jim I hope uh, and thank him for his patience as we have overrun. Thank you David, thank you Lars uh, and thank you all what a marvelous session and you're right uh, with uh, a session of this scope uh, it's uh, only possible to give a few teasers and uh, so uh, I've been uh, sitting here being very uh, scintillated uh, by everything that you've been saying. Uh, I would just note the, the, you know, the, the mention of donut economics as context. Uh, that's such a marvelous uh, image for all of us to hold that public health is part of the donut uh, that Kate Rayworth uh, has been espousing over the last number of years that really puts human well being at the center within the context of ecological systems and constraints. Uh, and we, uh, we love uh, Kate's work. We are in fact uh, uh, building a whole new MBA program uh, rather than a master's in business administration, assuming business as usual, we're uh, naming it the master's in regenerative uh, action. And uh, Ian uh, Kendrick is involved and uh, Kate Rayworth is gonna uh, launch uh, the MBA, MRA, uh, this May uh, with a course called the Foundations of Donut Economics. And Ed Muller, uh, who's a co-convener uh, from the University of International Cooperation, is also going to be offering a course on um, uh, the regeneration of human community and the larger bioregions around the world. Uh, and so I really have appreciated Lars and, and David, you're convening this panel on the, the really the environmental context for public health. Uh, it's, it, it is so important uh, for us to hold. And then the other point that I want to accentuate that was made uh, is around, you know, just an, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Uh, the statistics that were brought forth around that if you just if you just treat people with common sense, love and compassion, you integrate with the environment in a holistic way, guess what? Your medical costs go down, your traffic accidents go down, uh, the overall trauma of being alive and navigating through uh, you know, consumerist culture uh, goes down. Uh, it just totally makes sense uh, that the better we, we maintain our public health, in a holistic system, uh, just the more, the happier everybody is uh, and the better cared for everybody feels. And therefore, uh, the better our immune systems are. 
and the better capable we are of dealing uh, and navigating through uh, instances as we are right now uh, of a pandemic, uh, which has arisen uh, largely because of the fact that we haven't been engaging in the kind of healthcare um, perspectives and strategies and practices that have been illuminated today. Uh, so uh, I want to really thank the panel and uh, appreciate uh, everything uh, Lars, you and David are, are bringing uh, to our attention. And we look forward to next Thursday, again, where we'll, we'll be having a session four uh, of this uh, uh, um, uh, discussion on uh, public health in a time of COVID. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to turn our attention to a related matter, uh, and that's the issue of work. All of us have been challenged with how we work uh, over the last uh, year or so. And uh, we want to uh, uh, take that up. We'll be talking with Alfred Tolle uh, from Germany, um, who has really been contemplating uh, the nature and future of work uh, in a time of uh, the pandemic. Uh, so that'll be the same time, same station uh, tomorrow at 5 o'clock p.m. Central European time. Uh, and now we invite everyone who can to join our after uh, session a chat group. Uh, you'll see the link. Uh, in the uh, chat box. So we look forward to seeing you for a more informal conversation about these weighty matters. Uh, so thank you, panel. Thank you, David. Thank you, Lars. We'll see everybody again uh, here uh, tomorrow on Humanity Rising. Bye, everyone. <laughs>